If you're trying to improve your bone as naturally as possible, you've probably looked into soy or isoflavones or phytoestrogens. There's a surprising amount of controversy and confusion in this space, probably because the terminology is confusing, but also concerns wrapped around estrogen, which is generally misleading, but there's also issues then potentially with the addition of soy uh, and soy-like products into the diet. So the question is this, does a dietary approach focusing on phytoestrogens or isoflavones work for bone and hormone health? Is it safe? How much should you consume? Where should you get it from? Are there any concerns? And the answer is maybe, maybe, depends, and yes. As usual, there's a nuance and many variables to consider. So I'm gonna cover this topic in a couple of different videos to keep these digestible. Today is all about the actual food source of soy and the associated phytoestrogens. We will cover supplements mimicking these sources in other videos, but today is all gonna be just about soy as a tool for phytoestrogens and the potential isoflavones that can be added to soy because it's kind of hard to separate those in the literature. Now, if you've got a story around phytoestrogens, soy for osteoporosis, I wanna hear about it because hearing the stories that we see in our comments on YouTube are actually really helpful in us putting together different topics on things that people wanna hear about. So give us a little bit of feedback Tell us your stories on this topic. I'd love to hear about it. All right, so what are these things? And all these crazy words like phytoestrogen and isoflavone. So let's just take a step back and let's just talk about the parent group derivative. So phytoestrogen is a plant-derived compound with estrogen-like properties. And we'll just stop there. A phytoestrogen is something that comes from plants that has estrogen-like properties, meaning that it can mimic some of the activities of the hormone estrogen, specifically estradiol, in the human body. And there's the potential benefits or potential risks associated with activating those estrogen receptors without estrogen, right? So they're sort of mimicking estrogen in the body. Now, an isoflavone is a type of phytoestrogen. So remember, phytoestrogen acts like estrogen. Isoflavone is a subtype of phytoestrogen commonly found in legumes and soybeans are the richest source. So that's why we see generally people are going to talk about soy and derivatives of soy. The highest levels of isoflavones are found in foods such as tofu, tempeh, soy milk, edamame. There's a couple other different things you can choose. My approach when I see topics like this is to stop listening to the back and forth on social media and YouTube and really just dig into the studies because I want to see what the actual literature says because something like this is likely to have been well studied because of the potential risk. So let's look at the research for some guidance on phytoestrogens specifically in soy in this particular video. So I wanted to start with this 2014 review paper. So this a review paper is nice because it has a little bit of a narrative around it but it gives some background, some things that we can discuss. And what they talk about in here is that indeed phytoestrogens are strikingly similar in chemical composition to the estrogen that we have in the human body, specifically estradiol. Estradiol has two different receptors and the phytoestrogens uh, in soy can actually activate both alpha and beta receptors. So it can actually work on both sides that estrogen has the potential to work on, but it does have a preference for the receptor beta. So one over the other, and that's actually relevant because estradiol will stimulate both. And that's one of the reasons why natural estradiol is more balanced than other forms of estrogen. So a quick review here on those receptors. Estrogen receptor alpha is the one that's more prominent in bone. It's the one that's also thought to be more proliferative in nature. And that's why we need to balance it with uh, receptor beta uh, activity. But that receptor alpha activity is important because it will promote osteoblast survival and it will inhibit osteoclasts. And that's what we see that estradiol does. So estradiol has a significant impact on bone. Um, Estradiol beta, though, less prominent in bone, really more for balancing alpha in these tissues, and then it has other actions in other tissues. Despite this, in cell studies, phytoestrogens have been shown to activate proteins that build bone. We see mineralization of osteoblasts in uh, petri dishes, in petri dish studies, and we see inhibition of osteoclasts in those same studies. So you would think that we would see enhanced bone mineral density and bone formation when using these things in real life but do we? So let's look at the second study. So this is a 2024 systematic review and meta-analysis. So it's recent. It has 63 randomized control trials reviewed in it. That's a lot. The intervention group had almost 5,000 individuals in it. The placebo group had over uh, 4,000 individuals across all of the studies. And the goal in all of these studies was to evaluate isoflavone interventions for bone mineral density in postmenopausal women. 
Wow. So there's a tremendous amount of evidence here. But the challenge here is that the interventions are quite varied. I'm going to talk mostly and exclusively about the, the soy side of this, soy isoflavone specifically, and cut out some of the uh, supplement recommendations in here. But the results indicated that that soy isoflavone intervention does significantly improve bone marrow density at the lumbar spine, femoral neck, distal radius, in this specific group, which is postmenopausal women. But like I said, this was also, this was in soy and in supplements. Uh, what they did too, is they showed that if you were to break down what people were doing in the different studies is that the isoflavone intervention by itself, it was effective for improving bone mineral density only when the duration was over 12 months and only when the intervention contained a, what I will consider like a genistein equivalent, I'll explain that, but an equivalent of at least 50 milligrams per day. So what is genistein? Well, genistein is an isoflavone. So when you look at soy isoflavones, there's actually three major ones in there. The uh, soy isoflavones uh, are about made up 50% of genistein. So we wanna make sure that we're getting 50 milligrams of genistein in the soy isoflavone interventions that we talk about. So how much is that when you're talking about actual soy, so the whole food source? Well, it's actually not that much. Like I mentioned in other studies, uh, in other, I'm sorry, videos, when you're talking about supplements, sometimes you can have, you know, super physiologic doses. So lactoferrin is a good example, right? Where you can get 350 milligrams of lactoferrin in a supplement, and that would be like gallons and gallons of raw milk. So this isn't actually like that. So 50 milligrams of genistein would be about a half a cup of soybean, about two cups of tofu, depending on the type of tofu. Could be around a gallon to a gallon and a half of soy milk, uh, or about gram per gram for soy protein. So if you're actually eating soy protein by itself, 50 grams is probably around 50 grams, although it's a little variable. So I'm gonna cover genistein as a supplement in another video, but first I wanna get into the research looking at the soy isoflavones themselves. Before I do that, if you're having a hard time putting all this together, please consider joining our free masterclass. If you haven't done this already, it is free. It's an hour long. I go through how we put together a bone health program and answer questions for 10 to 15 minutes, depending on how quickly I go. Thousands of people, I think at this point, probably tens of thousands of people have found this to be helpful in their own journey because it just puts everything together in one place and it allows you at least a kickstart moving forward on your own program. Also exposes you to some other free resources. So again, if you haven't done it, I would encourage you to do that on YouTube. You can look for the link in the description um, of this video. And if you're listening to this on a podcast, you can go to optimalhumanhealth.com and you can find the link there. All right, now this next study is really cool because it actually compares soy isoflavones to estradiol, specifically uh, as a form of estrogen, and also to a bisphosphonate in actinol or risodronate. So this is a really cool comparison. Now, unfortunately, this study is really small. So I think they had 11 individuals in this study, uh, and they had four different isoflavones and actinol and estradiol. So that's six things, 11 people. I don't know how they did that but it can't be more than two people per intervention. Um, so obviously really, really small study, but it's worth looking at because this would be a really cool study to do on a bigger scale. And well, what they found is that the um, urinary uh, bone resorption markers is what they were looking at with the bisphosphonate and with estradiol went down by 22 and 24% respectively. So a couple of important points here. One is we're looking at the impact of the drugs in urine, which is okay, that's a way to measure it. Um, and estradiol outperformed, although not significantly, but outperformed the bisphosphonate. Um, so I think that's kind of cool. The isoflavones did actually reduce the net bone resorption, but only by 9%. So we'll call that a modest impact and a very small sample size and a pretty darn short study. So not particularly helpful um, in, in a big scale because we don't really know like what would happen over the long term and what if you had more individuals. So hard to draw a lot, but it is kind of a cool study showing that it has the potential, these isoflavones have the potential to be most impactful. And the soy isoflavone, by the way, was the most impactful of all of the other ones in there. Um, so that's really helpful, but we certainly need more data than that. And fortunately we have it. So this next study is a 2011 randomized control trial on 225 individuals. So thankfully we have more people. So this study was looking specifically at the soy isoflavone in doses of 80 to 120 milligrams per day. I'll explain what that means. Um, they also had a placebo group, so that's great. And they were looking at volumetric bone mineral density. So this is kind of a different way to look at bone mineral density and strength. Now, a soy isoflavone, like I said, is about 50% genistein. So 80 milligrams is a little under our, that genistein equivalent of 50 and 120 is at 60. So a little bit over. 
There's also not a lot of difference between those two groups. So if I could go back and redesign the study for them, I would have made that shift a little bit bigger. But they did the study for three years, which is cool. That's a long study for a supplement, especially with over 200 individuals. The outcomes were pretty technical and not easy to read, but it was helpful because it did separate out some things that you would usually look at, some, some typical bone mineral density things, but also some other things that might be more indicative of bone strength rather than just bone density by itself. So again, this is kind of a cool study. Now, what's interesting in the results are that there was bone loss for both interventions, meaning that the phytoestrogens, the isoflavones at these doses did not stop bone loss. However, the longer a woman was out from the onset of menopause, the more powerful the phytoestrogens were. Also, the bigger their rate of bone turnover as measured through urine markers, the bigger that measure, the more impactful the phytoestrogens were. And this kind of makes sense, right? So if you are going to... Um, hit and activate the estrogen receptors a little bit, the people that are at the most risk are probably going to see the most benefit. So that does make sense. Now, remember too, that these women were not on hormone replacement therapy. So these estrogen receptors were begging for estrogen and they were able to get a little bit of a, uh, an activation through the phytoestrogens, uh, but certainly not as much as you would get through estradiol. So then what about the concerns? And there is a study that actually does a good job of talking about some of the concerns around soy, and then we'll sort of extrapolate from there. So this last study I want to talk about is a 2017 randomized control trial, again, on 200 postmenopausal women. So great audience, reasonable number for a supplement or a dietary trial. And what they did is they looked at changes in bone turnover markers with soy supplementation for six months. So it's pretty good. Six months long. We'll take that too. What they did though, is they randomized 15 grams of soy protein. Now I mentioned soy protein is about gram for gram, uh, the equivalent of genistein. Again, varies quite a bit, but that's uh, an assumption. And then they also added 66 milligrams of soy isoflavone. So that's one intervention, soy protein and soy isoflavone. And then the other group was just soy protein on their own. And so that would be a little bit um, about half of that genistein equivalent of 50 milligrams versus probably about the same as what they recommended in that initial study. So you've got, again, half and then probably recommended, but the, the recommended is through both supplementation and soy by itself. So keep that in mind. So when you compare the intervention group that had more of a genistein equivalent, there was a reduction in CTX but there was also a reduction in P1 and P. Now, if you're not familiar with those biomarkers, CTX is a, a blood biomarker that looks at osteoclast activity. Osteoclast are the cells that break down bone. So when we're working on bone health with our patients, we want CTX to come down, not too low, but we want it to be relatively low because we want to break down bone, but not too quickly. We also want to push P1 and P up, but these biomarkers are linked. So generally, we're not going to see CTX go down and P1 and P go up. It happens, but that's usually not our goal because that would be unrealistic in all people. Um, so the, the fact that we see both come down is expected, but what really matters and what we measure for our patients is the ratio between P1 and P over CTX. How quickly are you building bone versus how quickly are you breaking down bone? It's hard to measure that in this study. So I can't really tell what the impact was on the P1 and P over CTX ratio. All we know is that it reduced both, which is um, kind of good. It might be the right move. It's just a little bit hard to tell. But the intervention that had more genistein equivalent was more impactful significantly than the one that had less. So take that for what it is. They also looked at additional uh, biomarkers and there was benefit from, again, the higher isoflavone uh, intervention in metabolic markers and in blood pressure over the soy protein by itself. Now, here's where the risk comes in. So what they noticed, though, is that TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone, which is uh, one of the labs that you can get to look at thyroid. Some doctors make this the only lab they looked at thyroid function with, but uh, they looked at TSH, free T4, which is kind of the storage form of thyroid hormone, and then free T3, which is the true active form. And so when you look at all three of those together, you can get a sense of what's going on with the thyroid. Now, what they noticed here is that TSH went up and free T4 went down, but free T3 was unchanged. So what does that mean? What they published on is that they had worsening thyroid function and that was concerning for them. I don't know that I would necessarily look at that the same way. And I don't know necessarily that that's clinically relevant without talking to the patient around symptoms. And, you know, are they actually seeing some changes in how they feel uh, with the TSH up and the free T4 down with the free T3 unchanged? My guess is that actually they would feel the same. So then 
let's talk about some of these potential risks because soy is not without risk. So could soy actually negatively impact the thyroid? And the answer is yeah. So soy is known as a goitrogen, but how much soy would it take to actually cause a negative impact on the thyroid? That's what a goitrogen is by definition. So soy does contain these little goitrogen substances that can interfere with thyroid function by inhibiting the body's ability to use iodine. But again, the question is how sensitive are you and how much would it take? And so is this really an issue with soy at, at normal dosing levels? But if you consumed it every day as your source of protein, yeah, it certainly could be. And maybe that's what they were seeing is that there was enough to actually get uh, the start of that kind of a risk. Another thing that's in soy that's concerning for a lot of us is these things called phytates or phytic acid. So phytates can bind to minerals like calcium and zinc and magnesium and iron in the gut, and it can reduce their absorption. Now, if you were to process the soy, particularly through fermentation, uh, then you can reduce the impact of the phytates. But again, if you're consuming raw or uh, tofu, then this could actually be an issue in the amount of calcium that you think you're getting, you may not actually be absorbing. So that could be an issue for some people and phytic acid can bother some people, I think more than others. There's also some potential allergen uh, issues associated with soy. So uh, particularly in children. Now, I think this might probably be more related to uh, soy being used in highly processed foods and, and kids having, uh, you know, poorly designed diets. So I don't know how big of an issue that's going to be in our uh, adult population. Certainly something to consider, though, if you just don't feel good after you eat soy, that's something to consider as well. The estrogenic effect is actually what we're going for in soy, but there are populations that probably wouldn't do well using a lot of soy as their protein source, again, because of this estrogenic effect. And so younger populations, younger women, it can mess with their cycle, and especially young men, especially if they are also at risk of having lower testosterone for various reasons, the estrogenic effect can actually really imbalance uh, a, a young man's uh, testosterone balance, especially if they're already at risk. So just something to consider too for different populations. And and then lastly, um, these protease inhibitors that you might hear about as anti-nutrients, soy does have those as well. Although, as long as you're cooking it and processing it appropriately, you can probably process most of those things out of there. If they do end up in there, though, they can inhibit the enzymes that you need for protein digestion. So that can be a challenge, especially if you're already on a limited protein diet. So the last thing here would be genetic modification. Actually, it's the second to last thing. Genetic modification or GMO, I think is an issue and soy is GMO almost globally in the United States. It's actually hard to find soy that's not GMO. It's also hard to find soy that doesn't have exposure to pesticides or glyphosate. So soy can be pretty toxic from that perspective. And so you have to make sure if you're going to consume it, it's gotta be organic. It's gotta come from a reliable source. Uh, and that can be hard to find, you know? So soy as a, a mass produced, Soybean and source of protein is probably pretty toxic and unfortunately something that most people need to avoid. So is soy the answer, right? Can soy actually help improve bone health? And, and for me, I don't think it's the answer. I think it's an answer. It's a tool just like we have, you know, hundreds of tools that we use, but it's probably not the best one in this group of phytoestrogens and isoflavones. Our team doesn't particularly love or recommend soy as a food to eat on a regular basis. A little bit of soy is probably not going to hurt you, but there are other ways to leverage this. So we'll do follow-up videos on genistein, on flaxseed, on other phytoestrogens, because again, there are probably better options than soy as soybean, edamame, tempeh, soy, soy milk, etc. There are probably better options and something that you could easily take as a supplement to get the benefits potentially of phytoestrogens. Make sure that you're subscribed to this channel and sign up for notifications if you want to be notified when these videos come out. If you like this video as a review of the food product of soy and the phytoestrogens associated with it, you might wanna consider this video on estrogen levels. Uh, this is something that I think a lot of women really need to know about if they're on replacement because not all estrogen replacement is the same. And then this video on incorrect beliefs around HRT is a nice compliment to that because there's a lot of misinformation around there, uh, out there rather around um, HRT and hormone replacement therapy and estrogen. So remember that. An osteoporosis diagnosis isn't the end, but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I'll see you in the next video.